see what happens. So this is 122. Yes. Maha Sunyata Sutta. So Sunyata is voidness. Um, so that's the great discourse on voidness. And it's a particular interest to us on retreat because that's what a retreat is. <laughs> the voidness and it's um, this one in particular there's the short discourse that comes before on voidness and uh, this is the long longer one they're both pretty good <laughs> uh, they're, but they're a bit different uh, in themselves but um, because what is voidness Sometimes we, there's so many things that people say, oh, voidness is no self. And, uh, but voidness is, voidness is many things. It's explained as many, it's explained in different ways. It's not many things, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but it's explained in different ways. So, as usual, remain remaining keeping an open mind on what is voidness what the Buddha meant as voidness because he also uh, said many times that uh, he discovered this abiding that is abiding in voidness and when people ask him what what do you abide in he said in voidness so and that's quite interesting I when I first read that I felt very uh, inspired because I thought oh that's really interesting like I want to do that <laughs> like I want to know how that works because you know like you read that stuff and you're like when you're looking at the breath like below your nostrils in and out that's what you do it's like and then you read something like that oh I abide in voidness it's like so how do I get from here to there <laughs> <laughs> how does that work took a while <laughs> took a while to figure things out with the help of many teachers and many people and especially the Buddha and the suttas. But I think um, I really like to just remain with what the words that he said and not trying to, you know, uh, invent too many things about it. And again, this, this very topic of voidness is is a very kind of debated one because people have all kinds of ideas what voidness is, you know. <laughs> and when we read the suttas, it's, you know, it's like the Buddha is kind of talking about it and he's talking about this abiding that he's living in and it's pretty close to cessation and signlessness, but it seems like it's also more open than that. It's not just niroda niroda, like at the very end. It seems like, like I was saying, it seems like it makes a certain impression on the mind, these states, and that we're able to call on them afterwards, or to remember what it feels like. Remember, call back to mind this voidness. And this is a, one of the places where he's, he's explaining a little bit more about that. And the context is uh, when Ananda and a lot of bhikkhus are making robes and they're all together and it's probably really you know like a lot of people and uh, they're trying to make robes with their little you know like needles and threads and many many monks and they're probably you know Ananda was doing so many things he was like the Buddha's assistant but he he was teaching the monks how to sew. 
he was because he knew like he was praised by the Buddha to know how to sew and to know like all the the stitching points and things like that and of course it was a very different method that was used it was like the katina frame was like all assembled and it's like close to the ground and they kind of stretch the robe on that and then they sew it and now we have tables and sewing machines <laughs> or you know um, our rules are very much uh, connected to that still for example it's when you dismantle the katina frame that like some rules start so something like that you know about the robes after the rains because the rains is the time you make the robes anyways so and needless to say that this was quite a big undertaking because uh, and I'm still very impressed at that because I don't know like it took me I mean I was pretty fast like because yeah I mean I could have taken more time to do it for sure <laughs> but um, it still took me many days and they, they were just needling it you know <laughs> like so it's quite it's quite a different state of affair so I, I'm, I'm assuming it's like you know base camp over there you know <laughs> and they're all you know and Ananda was also known to like teaching a lot lay people and uh, doing like doing a lot. He was only a stream mentor. He wasn't even in the higher training. So here the Buddha is kind of getting a little bit on his back, <laughs> in a good way, in in a way that because obviously he wants uh, the Buddha is always compassionate towards people and sometimes. If they s he sees somebody, a monk, especially going like doing something that's not going to be very beneficial, you know, in the long term, and he's the Buddha, so he has to think about, you know, not not right now too. It's like whatever he does, all the monks are going to do, you know, and then what what the monks are going to do, like all the lay people are going to do, <laughs> so um, it's very tricky. But he. In this discourse um, is that uh, instructions to to Ananda on uh, on always seeking the the this bliss of detachment, meditation, being alone, and uh, all that uh, trickles down into voidness and that abiding, and that's where that's what he should. Uh, aim towards and that there's no you know th like I said yesterday there's no magic pill there's no you know that's that's why we do retreats is to clear out our schedule so that we can actually be dedicated to that and then the next step is also you know how retreat is very wonderful but how do we keep integrating you know in in our lives depending on wherever we're at depending on however much we want to dedicate our lives to this practice but from a monk you're not gonna hear <laughs> to go and socialize that's for sure so um, so yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> I'm not gonna um, I'm always going to be uh, praising solitude and praising meditation because I mean that's obvious that the benefit and the happiness that derives from it is quite this is in Kapilavattu in Nigrodas Park and Kapilavattu is the town of the Sakyans the Sakyans are 
the Buddha's clan, the Sun Dynasty, and which is also Ananda's clan. Um, there was quite a quite a few Sakyans. Like the monks are called the Sakya Putta, the sons of the Sakyans, the, the Sakyan son. And that's the their main place there, Kapilavatu. That's where the Buddha was born, Siddhartha Gautama. And in the morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went to Kapilavatu for alms. And after his alms round, he went for the day's abiding in the dwelling of Kalaka Kemaka the Sakyan. Now on that occasion there were many resting places prepared in Kalakemaka, Kala the Sakyan's dwelling. So like I said, I think it was a bit of a base camp there because probably the end of Vasa, they were all making the robes. When the Blessed One saw this, he thought, there are many resting places prepared in Kalakemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Do many monks live here? Now on that occasion, the, the Venerable Ananda, along with many monks, was busy making robes at Gata, the Sakyan's dwelling. See, it's also interesting because uh, the robe making is very close to, you know, kneading materials and places you know you kind of been part of that but that was it's, it's, it's interesting because we have this very like the same situation but 2600 years ago <laughs> where those monks are all at these householders places to make their robes Venerable Sir, many resting places have been prepared at Kalakemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Many bhikkhus are living there. This is our time for making robes, Bhante. Ananda, a monk does not shine by delighting in company, by taking delight in company, by devoting himself in delight in company, by delighting in society, by taking delight in society, by rejoicing in society. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a monk who delights in company, who delights in society, will ever obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. This is not even my translation. <laughs> And it says bliss four times. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing the canon, this is a sequence that occurs that will obtain at will without any trouble or difficulty any of the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind. Usually that's what it's said is in there. In there. And now it's substituted by the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion. So we know that actually these things are synonymous. These four jhanas that constitute the higher mind, which is the training in the higher mind, adi, chitta, uh, which is also samadhi, the training of samadhi. And the other place that is found is in the definition of a nanagami. Um, one of the points of an anagami is that a non-returner can enter at will without any trouble or difficulty into any of the jhanas. Um,
although my take on this is that that includes cessation <laughs> because I don't um, I don't see that happening if like I see that happening in the in many people but that doesn't mean that they relinquish uh, certain fetters which are necessary for Anagam but it can be expected that, that, that when a, a monk lives alone withdrawn from society he or she will obtain at will without trouble or difficulty the bliss of renunciation the bliss of seclusion the bliss of peace the bliss of enlightenment And so this is why we, uh, the purpose of retreat. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a monk who delights in company, who delights in society, will ever enter, an up enter upon and abide in either the deliverance of mind that is temporary and delectable, or in the deliverance of mind that is perpetual and unshakable. Now these two things, and that is one of the rare places we find that in the canon, but it's wonderful. Uh, the temporary liberation of the minds are the jhanas, up to cessation, and even cessation itself. But the... Um, liberation of the mind that is perpetual and unshakable is arahantship. So when when the cessation has the opening has become wider and wider <laughs> and <laughs> it has uh, made a bigger and bigger impression in our minds and then um, all mental movements are relinquished and then it's when we go through the when a person goes through the jhanas it is temporary even up to cessation but when a person completely abandons all defilements then it's unshakable so it doesn't matter but it's interesting that there is mention of these two aspects on, on liberation which is quite interesting because we are actively actively practicing liberation even though it's temporary it is liberation but it can be expected that when a, a monk lives alone withdrawn from society he will enter an upon and abide in the deliverance of mind that is temporary and delectable or the deliverance of mind that is perpetual and unshakable. I do not see even a single form, Ananda, from the change and alteration of which there would not arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who craves for it and takes delight. However, Ananda, there is this abiding discovered by the Tathagata to enter and abide in voidness internally, giving no attention to all signs. So this is quite interesting for us because it points the way to what voidness is and what being without an object of meditation is and to actually carry that along. How do we do that? How do we make that place the resting place of the mind? And so this voidness here also is directly said that is voidness internally by giving no attention to all signs, which is signless. So voidness, voidlessness and signlessness, they're, they equate each other. So people say that they're really different and two really different things that talk about very different things. It's well, the Buddha is making this quite clear here. So, and that refers to a more advanced practice 
more advanced later stages of meditation where any kind of object whatsoever that arises in the mind is to be let go of. So that's where the practice is now. Release is the object, basically. You've heard me say that many times. <laughs> but whatever arises in the mind at this level, whether walking, sitting, laying down, it's release on autopilot and that what voidness means that's what that's what it means and, um, I I also quite like that it's a direct meditation instruction you know it's by giving up attention to all signs so it's just saying it quite clearly if while the Tathagata is abiding thus he is visited by monks and nuns by men and women lay followers by kings and king's ministers, by other sectarians or their disciples. Then with, with a mind leaning towards seclusion, tending and inclining to seclusion, withdrawn, delighting in renunciation, and altogether done away with things that are the basis for distractions. He invariably talks to them in a way concerned with dismissing them. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the Buddha's <laughs> mind state. <laughs> and that's, um, I think it's quite just a truthful reflection of what really, it, um, someone who really knows what the bliss of renunciation is. You know, um, there's another sutta where the Buddha says, when I see monks playing around and laughing and like chuckling and things like that, he says, these monks surely don't know how to abide in the bliss of seclusion. Because, yeah, of course, Sometimes we are kind of drawn to these things again. I mean that mainly for a retreat. I, I'm not going to be like if I was talking to monks or something like that. <laughs> but um, there's, yes, there are these other discourses where the Buddha would say when he sees other people like doing. Uh, some kind of things and like he's thinking like surely these people do not know <laughs> so it's actually I'm not making that up that's really uh, a way that the Buddha had to tell therefore Ananda if a monk should wish may I enter upon and abide in voidness internally he should steady his mind internally quiet it bring it to sink singleness and collect it and how does he steady his mind inter internally quiet it bring it to si singleness and collect it here on and then that's the first stage that we do together it's, it's quite wonderful uh, pretty uh, elaborate step step by step explanation <laughs> here on and quite secluded from sensual pleasures uh, without any surprise Secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. See, it's interesting because I read the suttas to people, including you, and those jhanas they come back so many times now people I'm, I'm just starting you know I'm just starting to read and they're quite secluded from London and people are like oh yeah <laughs> they know what's coming <laughs> it's like because <laughs> like, uh, and then I, I just skip it now because I know that people know them because I read the suttas and they're all over the suttas and so if we don't practice that 
then what's you know what, uh, it's the most um it's one of the most common teaching in there so when if we take that out as being like a inaccessible as like a absorption concentration that takes years then we lose we lose all of this you know a lot of people they don't even read some of these suttas because they talk about the jhana and i mean that means like 40% of them <laughs> because when they hit the jhanas they think it's absorption but it's not Now the four jhanas, that's how a monk steadies his mind or her mind internally, quiets it, brings it to singleness and collects it. It says concentrates it. But. Then he or she gives attention to voidness internally. While he or she gives attention to voidness internally, One's mind does not enter into voidness internally. So it's still unsettled. So it takes a while. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision in the voidness. See? So that's kind of what we're working on. When that is so, one understands, while I am giving attention to voidness internally, my mind does not enter into voidness internally. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he or she has full awareness of that. So, we're not trying to make it different, that's just the way it is. And there's only one way, is to keep releasing, keep relaxing keep practicing. One gives attention to voidness externally. So from the platform of the four jhanas, now the mind is very clear, very still. And the four jhanas, I mean, they are very close. Like the fourth jhana is where all the arupa jhanas are. So when we talk about the four jhanas, we're also talking about all the way to the end. It's just not explicitly mentioned here. Um, but with that firm base of the mind, then the mind is in a place, in a state where it can contemplate this. It can touch, it can feel, it can experience, it can understand what voidness can be like. And now it's internally as we go, as f for ourselves, but also externally. And that's a wonderful retreat instruction also. Internally, externally, void, void. One gives attention to im... And then, uh, as a third one, one gives attention to imperturbability. While one gives attention to imperturbability, One's mind does not enter into imperturbability or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. And see, here we have a parallel between imperturbability, which is the quality of the fourth jhana, the formless jhanas and higher, usually, and voidness. So it's interesting. Now we have a parallel of formless jhanas and voidness also. Slowly, We are getting to understand more about what that voidness is. So he's incapable of staying there, or it doesn't acquire confidence in it. When that is so, one understands while I am giving attention to imperturbability, my mind does not enter into imperturbability, nor acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, one has full awareness of that. So we don't push that away. We just, that's what it is. And we don't fall into delusion of thinking that, no, that's voidness. It's not completely. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't settle into it. But 
up, that's fine. Then that monk should steady his, his or her mind internally, quiet it, bring it the singleness, and collect it on the same sign of collectedness as before. Now, what is that saying? There's a few ways of interpreting that, but I think that if it's not actually settling down into this, you might want to continue with you know, a kind of a, a vehicle of awareness that is, you know, that will uplift the mind. And that can be as little as smiling. Sometimes the mind, it won't settle into these deeper states because we've lost a little bit of joy. We're starting to take it a little too seriously. Because sometimes that's just the way the mind works. It's just that little slight clinging. That's like, oh no, but I have to sit. No have to smile <laughs> and the mind becomes very sharp again and then it just goes right there so that's what I would say is that that object of not object but that sign of collectedness as before I would have to check the Pali it's an interesting thing though but often At that point, you know, uh, that's why I put so much emphasis on smiling because it actually is very important all the way till the end. When you see someone really enjoying their meditation, like really enjoying it, like you know, <laughs> because that's just the way it is, you know, <laughs> or, um, yeah, and that's just the way it's explained so well in the suttas also, and just the definition of the jhanas. Yes. So, coming back to that sign of collectedness, that sign that will collect the mind, that sign is anything associated with joy or uh, letting go maybe. Then one gives attention to voidness internally again. See, now we'll come back to that uh, voidness. While one is giving attention to voidness internally, one's mind enters into voidness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. When that is so, one understands, while I am giving attention to voidness internally, my mind enters into voidness internally and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, one has full awareness of this. And see, here we have another uh, angle and that tells us what the Buddha means by full awareness, Sampajanya, which follows along with Sati usually. And full awareness is just just knowing what, what is. So uh, that's, that's good. One gives attention to voidness externally, and now this time it works. <laughs> uh, one gives attention to voidness internally and externally. One gives attention to imperturbability. So we simply direct our mind to be undirected. <laughs> and um, as we do this, the mind will acquire confidence. And in this way, one has full awareness of that. So whether it works or not, it's still the same. But we continually try to strive towards that objectless release. When a monk abides thus, if, if their mind inclines to walking, one walks thinking. While I am walking thus, no unwholesome states of covetousness and grief will beset me. And that just means when you abide in voidness, everything that comes up, no. Just no. <laughs> just stay there, acquiring steadiness still, even while walking. 
In this way, one has full awareness of that. And when a bhikkhu abides thus, if his mind inclines to standing, one stands. If his mind inclines to sitting, he sits. If one's mind inclines to laying down, one's lay down. One lies down, thinking, while I am lying down, thus no unwholesome states will beset me. In this way, one has full awareness of that. So sometimes the Buddha praised going to sleep mindfully. So, of course, he says on the right side in the lion's paws, but <laughs> with one hand on the side, and, you know, like this. Um, which actually is quite wonderful. Um, I uh, I think that without trying to force that, uh, like impose it on, but leaving it as an open kind of suggestion that um, you know when when going to sleep because often in meditation retreats we become very awareness kind of boys up and uh, uh, sometimes we want to go to sleep but it's uh, we're just aware kind of thing and not to go against that and to actually keep nurturing that and the body can lay down in whatever way you feel the body lays down but not trying to kill awareness actually trying to continue enjoying it and then actually what happens is that sleeps comes naturally it, of course it will it will come but there's no there's no desire for it to come. There's no like oh I should be sleeping right now and just like trying to turn on your side and like kill it, <laughs> not kill it but put out awareness, you know. And then uh, that's kind of creating you know um, that kind of mental state is the mental state that's going to sleep. So like nah I don't wanna. And in fact, we have much better sleep when we go to sleep whenever it's going to come, laying down, resting the body. And, um, and that can be done also anytime during the day, you know, sometimes, especially sitting a long, long times, like you, you, you get your little bit of walk and if, if there's a little bit of tiredness or whatever uh, that because of a thin night or whatever happens you can just do that lay that lay down on your side the right side actually really works very well but i mean there's limits to what that can do without hurting yourself <laughs> and um sometimes just mindfully resting the body not even falling asleep or anything and just resting and it feels um, you know there's a certain s the rest and digest state also is you know a lower kind of vibrational state where we have to stop doing things and the body kind of you know it, it digests a little bit and you know it has it does things that it's not going to do if we don't actually take a break <laughs> or like um, so I think it's a, a healthy thing to do. Um, but mainly, mainly um, going to sleep. Sleep is so much better, actually, when when we don't try to go to sleep, but when sleep just comes and takes takes over. <laughs> And uh, we're lucky here for uh, sloth and torpor. We have a lake, so <laughs> so that's very good. It's gonna gives you some energy. 
Oh yeah, it's cold. It says, even when I'm lying down, no unwholesome states will beset me. So just c keeping that clear, beautiful mind. In this way, one has full awareness of that. When a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to talking, he resolves such talk as is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which does not lead to disenchantment, this passion. I usually use calming down here, but cessation, peace direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, talk of kings, robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, battles, food, drink, clothing, beds, garlands, perfumes, relatives, vehicles, villages, and towns, cities, countries, women, heroes, streets, well gossips, the dead, trivialities, the origin of the world, <laughs> the origin of the sea, whether things are so or not so, such talk I shall not utter. In this way, he has full awareness of that, but he resolves such talk as deals with effacement, effacement, as favors the mind's release, and which leads to the complete, to complete disenchantment, calming down, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. That is, talk on wanting little, talk on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue, con collectedness. I like these two. Aloofness from society and arousing energy. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. Quite, uh, so we're not, it's a very special teaching. <laughs> it's like, it's not because, not just doing nothing in the woods, it's actually meditating. Virtue, collectedness, wisdom, deliverance, knowledge, and vision of deliverance. The actual experience, these talks. Such talk I shall utter. In this way, he has full awareness of that. When a monk abides thus, if his, his, mind's, if his mind inclines to thinking, he resolves. Such thoughts as are low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which do not lead to disenchantment, calming down, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment and nibbana, that is, thoughts of sensual desires, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. Such thoughts I shall not think. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But he resolves, such thoughts as are noble and emancipating and lead the one who practices in accordance with them to the complete destruction of trouble. That is thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of ill will, uh, thoughts of non-ill will, <laughs> and thoughts of non-cruelty. Such thoughts I shall think. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual desires. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, Odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desirable, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasures. 
Here in a bhikkhu should constantly review his own mind thus. Does any mental excitement concerning any base among these five chords of sensual pleasure ever arising? And that's, that's also another wonderful instruction on retreat for us. When we're walking, standing, sitting, laying down, what's the mind doing? Why do we break a sit? Is it the mind just can't let go about something? I mean, of course, after four or five hours, you know, the body kind of... Of course, if you want to go longer, uh, that's <laughs> always good. I mean, there we, there is a... more advanced there is a um, a little bit more to be said about you know, dealing with sensations that come up and things like that but um, but to be on the retreat to be reflecting upon and it's not like an active thinking it's just to know to know and ask yourself uh, whenever you're walking to notice the, what's my mind doing? What's am I thinking about? I don't know something else <laughs> uh, because the way that the door opens more and more at the end <laughs> there there. Um, is not just a matter of meditation anymore. It's really a matter of, actually, it's way more a matter of what we do with our minds when we stop sitting. <laughs> then it's like if the mind is allowed free range, you know, to just roam about in anything it wants without even noticing any kind of tension, without any noticing that it's actually disturbing the mind without letting it go, then we don't know, but we're actually cultivating hindrances for our next sit. <laughs> so often, you know, where you are is, is like actually the meditation is very important. That's the first block where, you know, first we need to sit longer, like four or five hours, and then what happens between those sits is very important too then because the, it's so subtle at that point you know just allowing your mind to just roam about for whenever you're walking or anything will make the whole difference when you sit and either you will go back to that state right away or it's going to take another three hours you know so like starting fresh again, <laughs> starting from, from that same place. But again, it's not something to force, it's just something to be aware of, something to let go more and more. So reflection, pacha wakana. If on reviewing his mind, the bhikkhu understands mental excitement concerning a certain base among these five chords of sensual pleasure does arise in me. Then he understands desire and lust for the five chords of sensual pleasure are unabandoned in me. And see, that's a very wonderful instruction to know about non-returning. Because the non-returner doesn't have lust for that. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But if, on reviewing one's mind, that monk understands no mental excitement concerning any base among these five chords of sensual pleasure arises in me, then he understands the desire and lust for this, the five chords of sensual pleasure are abandoned in me. And this very often is quite interesting, in fact, people will claim something like that because 
they just look where it's nice <laughs> they just look where it's obvious that there's nothing but uh, you don't look for anger when everything is perfect you look for anger when somebody you don't like comes up to you and starts shooting your names <laughs> so you know it's like yeah maybe you haven't seen them arising for a while but it's tricky because it's the problem with delusion is that that these things when they arise we're actually not conscious <laughs> of them so very often people think that they're free from them so it's tricky using the words sometimes to describe things sometimes you know I've had people that you describe the whole sequence to the jhanas and the people they, they cling to the words they, they kind of make it up in their minds like they think oh yeah I know this like I've experienced I can experience this like somebody would that doesn't meditate at all they come back to me so, oh yeah I know but it's tricky because it doesn't work like that <laughs> it's not um, And, and sometimes I say this as an example because sometimes it's like anger. It's like, oh, someone, someone can know if they're non-returning. They see they they never have anger arising in them. It's like, oh, I don't have anger because they've read it. They think, oh, I don't have anger. I'm good. But sneaky. <laughs> And impatience is a form of anger. Or, well, and also there is a difference. There are some people are prone more to anger, but some people that are not prone to anger, which don't see anger arising in them, but they're prone to other things. <laughs> so, um, and also, uh, pride is a major hindrance. <laughs> so. Uh, like thinking that you don't have hindrances or like things like that it's actually very bad for you because if you don't see it then you can't even let it go so <laughs> you're pretty far from that so I'm always on the lookout you know I'm never thinking <laughs> oh yeah it's not there <laughs> I'm always looking for it to arise actually that's the other you know and then you make sure that actually you're not going to be on the side of that you think it's not arising anymore. Because I've seen that too many times now. <laughs> People that think it, it's not in them, and it is. And that's the biggest hindrance you can have. Because you're not even going to see it. Because you really think and you tell people that it's not in you. So, Anyways, I try to really stay away from that. Just a friendly <laughs> advice, I guess. <laughs> um. Ananda, there are these five aggregates affected by clinging. In regard to which among should abide contemplating, arising, and passing away? Such is material form. Such is its arising such its disappearance, such is, such are sensation, such are its arising, such its disappearance, such are, such is perception, such its arising, such its disappearance, such are formations, such their arising, such their disappearance, such is consciousness, such its arising, such its disappearance. When one abides contemplating the rising and passing away uh, in these five aggregates affected by clean, the conceit I am 
based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is abandoned. What could I am cling to if this whole island is burning? When that is so, that monk understands the conceit I am based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is abandoned in me. In that way, he has full awareness of that. See, full awareness is very much related to just knowing things for what they are. These states are entirely wholesome and have wholesome outcomes. They are noble, supramundane, and inaccessible to the evil one. That is Mara. <laughs> I just get a kick out of that when they translate it as evil one. Tamara. To whatever unwholesome state. Cannot actually get to you because it's got nothing that it can hold on to. What do you think, Ananda? What good does a disciple see that he should seek the teacher, the, te the teacher's company? Venerable sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. Ananda, a disciple should not seek the teacher's company for the sake of discourses, stanzas, and expositions. I'd say like pretty discourses, stanzas, and expositions, like poetic. Not, not poetic, but you know what I mean. Just because he's a good teacher. Why is that? For a long time, Ananda, you have learned the teachings, remember them, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind, and penetrated them by, well by view. But such talk as deals with effacement, as favors the mind's release, and which leads to the complete turning away, calming down, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. Repeats all these talks again. It is for the sake of of such talk that a disciple should seek the teacher's company. Not just for company. <laughs> Too bad. Since this is so, Ananda, a teacher's undoing may come about. Undoing, a pupil's undoing may come about. And the undoing of one who lives the holy life may come about. And how does a teacher's undoing come about? Here some teacher resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a jungle thicket, a heap of straw. And while he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. And as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desires then succumbs to craving, reverts back to luxury. This teacher is said to be undone by the teacher's undoing. He has been struck down by unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in problem, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. This is how a teacher's undoing come about. How does a pupil undoing come about? Same thing, emulating his teacher, he does the same thing. So I'm not going to read the whole thing again. And how does the undoing of one who lives the holy life come about? That was just any other person like any other teacher and any other student, but now he's talking more about his teaching. 
Here a Tathagata appears in the world accomplished and fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of the worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be taught, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He resorts to a secluded resting place, a forest, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. Yet he does not go astray or become filled with desire, succumb to the craving and revert to luxury. He's talking about the Buddha. He's talking about himself. But a disciple of this teacher, it's funny because he's always talking about the third, third person, about himself, this teacher, me, him, emulating his teacher's seclusion resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, a heap of straw. I think he's saying that to Ananda, just to let him know of the, that danger of, you know, living. There's other suttas where, you know, a deva comes to Ananda, and he's just like, his mind is just... He says... Because he's been teaching uh, lay people a lot, and he's, he says like, "What's all this? What's all this babbling gonna do for you, Ananda? <laughs> go, go in the forest, put nibbana in your heart, and meditate." And that doesn't mean don't ever teach them, but it just means, you know, be careful. So while he lives, thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. And as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, desire and succumbs to craving, reverts to luxury. This, this one who lives the holy life is said to be undone by the undoing of one who lives the holy life. He has been struck down by unwholesome states and that defile and bring renewal of being, give trouble, and ripen in problems. Thus there comes to be the undoing of one who leads the holy life. And herein, Ananda, the undoing of one who leads the holy life has a more painful resort, result, a more bitter result, than the teacher's undoing or the pupil's undoing. Because the teacher and the pupil of a craft, for example, they're not. Uh, the Buddha talks about a lot about fame and gain, and how that really distorts the mind of people. It really is. And he, there's so many suttas where he warns the monks, whereas to be careful. And he says himself, like many times. That Never, never let fame come to me, <laughs> because he just likes solitude. So, and that's his advice on that, basically, is to be careful, because, and and unfortunately, you can see that happening to the monastic community, unfortunately. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And how do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness? Hear Ananda. Compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness saying that. His disciples do not want to hear and give ear or exert their minds to understand. They err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness. And how do disciples behave towards the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility? Hear Ananda, 
compassionate and seeking their welfare. The teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion, thinking, this is for your welfare, this is for your happiness. His disciples want to hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. They do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave toward the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. I shall, I shall not treat you as the putter treats the raw, damp clay. Repeatedly restraining you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. Repeatedly admonishing you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. The sound core will stand the test. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And I... I like this ending. I was wondering how, how I could uh, relate that to, to this teaching, you know, retreat environment. And actually, this kind of thing happens quite a lot, actually, <laughs> on retreat when you say something to someone and they just don't listen. <laughs> They're like, they think, oh, he's like, <laughs> who's that guy like, telling me to sit for five hours? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, it's interesting uh, sometimes the reactions that that you can get from saying these things. But it's also funny because knowing the path, you just know what happens, you know, you just know how it works. <laughs> and so, the two, three retreats after, people say, oh yeah, and then I started sitting longer. Like My mind became very, very quiet and still. It was so blissful. It's like, this... <laughs> I've been telling you. But that's great. Everybody has... So it's interesting. Um, sometimes it sounds a bit intense you know what the instructions can be and i'm really really not intense at all in my way of teaching i think i just it's just the the sheer idea of sitting for five hours for, for some people is you know just just completely out there but slowly as the, the mind calms down they start to see it and it's like Um, but knowing also the goodness that comes from all of it and just keep repeating the same thing because we just actually we want people to be happy we want to we I want other people to understand these states to, to actually live them so and usually I just let people do what they want to do I just give them the actual information as it is and people you know even that sometimes a year after it's like they they get back to me <laughs> and uh, it took a year and it finally clicked and it's somebody's something that somebody else said and that made them click i was like oh good <laughs> you got it so that's why it's nice to have um, it's nice to have more experienced more serious people that are interested because then they can actually commit they usually are willing to actually commit and that's you know the, the amount of merit that is made by people who are actually willing, like they see the benefit and they, they, they try and they see the Dhamma. It's like you could give a talk 
5,000 people about something, you know, about virtue, which is wonderful. But you, somebody, a single person, could sit for 10 days. And that would be more, way more meritorious. So I prefer that, actually. Prefer to have a small, very strong core community. And from that, you know, make sure that it's good. Merits, if you have questions, maybe questions after. Dukkha patta chani dukkha, bhaya patta chani bhaya, soka patta chani soka, hum tu sabbe vipanda. Idang no punyang sabbe satta nu modantu, sabba sampatti siddhya, aga satta jabu matta, deva naga mahi dikha, punyang tanga nu moritva. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired, or the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana.